May all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be free from harm. May all beings love life. May all beings awaken. Welcome to another QQ Audio podcast. I'm DC Puba of QQ Audio and QQ Archives, preserving the legacy of Shinju Suzuki and those whose paths cross his. And anything else that comes to mind, I pray that you and yours are safe and comfortable, free from economic hardship, and able to get out and do whatever it is you want within the limitations of the universal precept of do as little harm as possible. So today we're going to have a guest, one Jim Morton. Jim uh, was at Tassajara the first year we had it, and that's the year he came to Zen Center from Vermont. And uh, he uh, went on to Japan in the early 70s, maybe 74, I think. And um, uh, he was still in Japan when when uh, I moved there in 88. And Katrinka and I visited him in 2014. But then four years ago, he came back to Vermont. Uh, so um, he studied uh, calligraphy very seriously. He always studied Zen. And uh, those are his two loves, uh, Zen and calligraphy. Meditation and calligraphy, really. Oh, I, I want to add one thing. Um, so Jim's from Vermont. I don't know where in Vermont, or if he said, I forget. And um, next week, uh, we're going to hear an uh, interview with his brother, Rick Morton, from Vermont. And uh, we just had um, here a, a house guest from Vermont, uh, Michael Katz's uh, nephew, Carol Williams' son, and because he was here, um, we mentioned. Oh, we have friends. We have friends here from Vermont, and uh, you know, t said a few things about him. Oh, yeah, uh, uh, Tomas Frick, and his wife uh, Sylvia, and. You know, Tomas came here in the 74 and uh, speaks Balinese, and they, they started a big spice company, and now he, uh, he uh, exports uh, biofuels, and he knows more about Bali than anybody I know. Uh, and uh, Isha, our guest, said, oh, yeah, I, I, I know who that is. I've been in his home. So I sent uh, Tomas uh, a uh, WhatsApp, and Sylvia one, and uh, said, "Hey, we got somebody here from from you know um, the Brattleboro, Mar Marlboro area, and uh, our our house guest uh, Asia. They 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 run a uh, they they have a organic farm there, and oh yeah." So Tomas, I always like seeing Tomas. He he joined us for dinner, so it's just been it's been Vermont week. So I just thought <laughs> I'd mention that. <laughs> so uh, let's um, give Jim a call uh, right after we've had our pause to meditate. So when you hear the bell, if you're of such a mind, hit pause and meditate or whatever for as long as you want. And when you're ready to come back, hit unpause, and we'll be there to hit the bell to end the meditation or whatever and give Jim Morton a call.
Jim. Yeah. Hi. How are you doing? Hi. David here. Good. Good. Um, I'm sitting in front of my PC. Are you going to call on Messenger? No. We're talking now. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this is good. So uh, I, I, I wanted Messenger in case you were in Japan. Oh. Because uh, I'm calling you with Skype, and it's free to United States or Canada, but I have to pay for Japan. I see. I mean, it's not free. I pay $30 a year for unlimited. <laughs> you, can, you can call me on Skype. No, we're talking. It's good. We have a good connection. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So what's happening? What are you up to? Well, um, I moved back here uh, in 2018, so that's about how four years ago, right? Where's all, here? Where's here? Here is in, in Rutland, Vermont, where I grew up. Ah, ah, wow. And um, I had a house here for you know since around 2000 or so. Hmm. And. Uh, my Filipina wife was living here, and I would spend my, you know, a couple of months of the year here mm -hmm. um, um, for, you know, years and years, for almost 20, what, 15 years or so. Yeah. And then, and all of my, my university jobs all ran out because of the mandatory retirement age. What is that? And, uh, hmm? What is the well, mandatory it, retirement age? Well, every company and university has a mandatory retirement age. So my, the various different universities I was teaching at, one was 65, another one was 70, and another one oh. was 72. So oh. Fi finally, fi finally, I didn't have, I had some side jobs, but I was just wasn't making enough money anymore, so... Uh -huh. uh, and other, it was getting hard for me to live in Japan for other reasons too, hmm. medical things I needed. Uh, I wasn't on the Japanese um, health insurance program, so you weren't. I needed you weren't. No, no. Well, we were when we lived there. It was great. What what changed? Yeah. Well, I got off it years and years ago because it was so expensive and I just never um, never got on it again. Oh my God, it didn't cost us anything. Well, things have really changed. It was just incredibly well, it good was cost, 30 it was years ago. Yeah, well, you were in a good situation. Wow. But um, it was costing me like $300 a month or something like that to be on it. Mm-hmm. Huh. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. So, and I needed, uh, my knees were shot. I needed knee replacements and various other things. Have you had that? Um, yep. How, how are your knees? Oh, that's the only part of me that doesn't hurt now. <laughs> oh, that's great. Pardon me. <laughs> uh well, so so, uh, how are you spending your time? You doing any art, calligraphy? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm still working on that. Very, very slow, but I'm making progress. It's hard with a <laughs> without a teacher, you know, just experimenting on my own, and well, without other people to to work well, you know, to uh, communicate with about it. Uh huh. Uh huh. But. Uh, you, this is calligraphy, right? Where, 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 how would yeah. you describe what you do? It's kind of difficult. I mean, calligraphy is, people imagine that it's a matter of making nice looking, you know, nicely shaped uh, Chinese characters, but it's not actually. It's um, real calligraphy is the, um, you know, the the power and the brush stroke. It's kind of like sculpture in a way. Like every, every brush stroke has got this is internal rhythms and musculature. Mm -hmm. And you just don't put that in there intentionally.
conventionally. Uh, it comes from the arm movement and everything. And it's, it's all, you know, you have to be one with the whole process and uh, the way the brushes moves and so forth. is just extremely arcane mm. and extremely hard, hard to learn. Mm. And, uh, and so... You said it's hard to do, to do without a teacher, and then you added without other people who are savvy to it to relate yeah. to. Because I would think at this point you are a teacher. No, far, 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 far from it. Really? Yeah. No, not even remotely. Ha, huh, how humble of you. I mean, you've been doing it forever. <laughs> yeah, I have been doing it forever, but it's just really, really difficult. Huh. 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 I mean, even if you look at you look at the great calligra the calligrapher of great calligraphy of great calligraphers like um, Kobo Daishi, if you can see works of his that, oh, you know, from the time he was young until he was older, that you can see over, over many many years is a great difference in power. Mm. But as a foreigner, uh, and you know my other art education uh, is, you know, Western art, other types of art, the approach is so different that um, it's hard to overcome certain habits of, of uh, mind, hand, uh, you know, coordination and co consciousness. Uh -huh. And calligraphy, it's a very, kin a very uh, kinetic thing, kinesthetic thing. Mm. So it's very mm. on me. And that's what fascinates me about it. So <laughs> Yoshi said one time that uh, calligraphy was uh, really hard to learn for people who were good with their hands. And that was cer that's certainly true with me because I'm, I can do almost anything I, I want with my hands. Um, for you know, for wood woodwork or paintings, you know, Western style drawing, uh, art drawing and painting and sculpture and uh, you know, playing musical instruments and stuff like that. But calligraphy is just a, 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 such a different thing. Huh. that's a very interesting comment from uh, Suzuki Roshi. Hmm. It's certainly true. I mean, certainly, certainly uh, true of, in my case. Huh, 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 wow. Uh, so, uh, are you living with someone? Um, I have a Japanese um, lady that I met a couple of years ago, the last time I was over there. Um, she was, we were both on our way to Cebu, and uh, she's from Kyoto, and we rode in the, the, uh, we rode down. I, I was just so happy to be back in Japan and speaking Japanese again that I just wanted to talk to everybody. So I just started a conversation with her and just by accident we were seated opposite on the opposite sides of the aisle from one another in the airplane. Mm -hmm. So we just kept talk, talking and by the time we uh, got to Cebu we were already warming up to one another. Hmm. And then, uh, then after we separated in Cebu, she went off to die for a few days and then went back. And we communicated by um, text. And then when I got back here, we, we started talking on Skype. And uh, we spoke, we talked every day for two years and three months in Japan. You haven't seen her? Well, she she finally came because of COVID. She was wasn't able to come. Yeah, for a long time, and then uh, she was finally managed to come on May twelfth, and she's staying till May seventeenth. And it's just really really nice to have her around. We we just get along extremely well. So she was only yeah. there for five days. Absolute doll. Hmm. Uh. I no, she's 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 came on the twelfth of, of May and she's leaving on the seventeenth of June. Oh, seventeenth of June. 
Well, you should so keep I, her there. Why don't you keep her there? Yeah, well, she's got a, you know, she has a business and, uh, she's changing her life. Yeah. I mean, she was teaching piano. She's piano students and she, she has a little, um, she's has a little company of her own yeah. that she runs. She runs with her son. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, kind of consult, consulting sort of thing. Mm -hmm. ah. and she's trying to, trying to at least semi retire. She's talking to her son right now in the next room. Oh yeah. I can hear her. We can hear her pretty well. Yeah. Uh, I hear the Japanese being spoken. Yeah. Well, we just, you know, it don't, I, I can't tell it's Japanese, but I can hear a woman talking in the background. So what else is it like there where you are? What else is happening? Well, it's, I've had this, house, this enormous house for 20 years and then fixed it up a real lot, but ran, finally ran out of money and ran out of youth. But I have a workshop in the garage and everything. And, um, and Vermont, of course, is an extremely beautiful place. The weather sort of sucks, but uh, it's one yeah. of the prettiest places in the country. And the people are nice here. Mm. It's kind of back and it's yeah. um pol yeah. politically it's it's it tends to be rather progressive and yeah yeah so hey jim so uh your your uh, life path has been uh uh am i right has been sort of uh art and buddhism yep um so how did that all start off where where what are the roots of of those two uh, streams. Well, like a lot of other people, and I've always been, uh, you know, since, since I since I was born, I always had some feeling that that there was something out there that I was that I was looking for. Mm -hmm. um, and I never quite fit in with anybody else, or um, you know could never fit in with the groups and so forth. And I, I envied them in a way as I thought they were all having such a good time and everything. But whenever um, I tried to be part of any groups, I just, it just seemed so hollow and empty. I just didn't feel like I belonged there. So I always, you know, wondered what I should be doing. And uh, then in, the, in college, I mean, in high school, I just sort of lost any ambition to study and, you know, be anything that um, you know society wanted me to. <laughs> I just, just, mm. I just want always always wanted just to escape and to disappear. That's all I wanted. Mm. I didn't really, you know, I was good at drawing and so forth, good at art, and so I uh, went to down to. Uh, decided to apply to Rhode Island School of Design and then I um, uh, went down there and saw all these people walking around with paint smeared all over their clothes and plaster and, and their hair all shaggy and everything and I thought, oh, wow, this is for me. <laughs> <laughs> there, you know, it, was a good, it was a good time yeah. to be there. I mean, I had, yeah. I had friends in school like Martin Mull and uh huh. Oh, neat, yeah. neat. And other other. Yeah, people. I always liked Martin Mull. Yeah, yeah. We used to hang out together. Ah, ah. Very dry sense of humor. Yeah. Very real smart guy. A little too, too, yeah. too self-aware for my taste, though, in, in a way. Uh huh. Uh -huh. And then, uh, anyways, this, uh, you know, I, I went, went and continued feeling kind of lost. And, um, and, and at first, you know, I just had, uh, started to feel like art wasn't really what I thought it was. It wasn't going to give me what I thought, thought it, what I hoped it would. Yeah. And then, uh, then LSD came around, showed up. And 
one of my friends took it and he was normally just, just such a goofy guy, but he just he put his hand on his my, my shoulder and looked looked me in the eye and he said it can't be missed. You know, and there's this, a look in the eye. I mean, he said that with a sincerity that I, I'd never never seen before. So I decided to try it, and then <clears throat> um, mm, mm-hmm. had a pretty profound experience. Which I won't mm. go into too much, but uh, but I, I realize that there's something in there. I that 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 what that what I what I really wanted in life that I didn't know I wanted was 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 in there mm. uh, somehow. Oh. But I I knew that just taking drugs over and over again wasn't going to do anything, and I just happened to. I thought that meditation must be what that must be what meditation is for. It could only be what else could it be for? Yeah. So yeah. Um, there is one guy um, who is a a temporary English teacher there with a couple years contract who had been to India and stayed in an ashram over there and so on. And I didn't have him for a teacher myself, but my best friend had and told me about it. So I talked to him and he said, well, why don't you come to my office and uh, we'll talk about it. So I did. I mean, he's kind of a weird guy from the middle Midwest that wore his rubbers all the time and all in, inside the house and out. <laughs> When you say rubbers, you mean, uh, what do you mean? Aloshes, you know, the rubber over, over your shoes. Huh, you know, that's an old, old term. I guess it's an East Coast term. Really? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's certainly not a California term because nobody wears them out there. But Yeah. Nobody wears them here at all. Nobody wears them at all anymore. I remember that from when I was a kid, you know, I went, wow, yeah. In the evening, he was just sat. We just sat down, looking at facing each other, and he was started saying, "Well, what, what would you do that only relates to you and I right now, and not not to anything else?" And I was just totally stumped by that. I took this the question very seriously, and finally, I just uh, made a single motion with my hand or something like that. And then he said, well, okay, well, what what would you, what would you do next? And then I made another one and we together this way, we together, we just worked out this, um, this hand motion thing between the two of us as a kind of form of meditation that we invented ourselves. Hmm. But, I had some interesting realizations when we were doing that. I mean, we would do this all night, you know, from from uh, after dinner all the way until daybreak. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. It was pretty. It's pretty intense. Yeah. And uh, I had some you know interesting experiences that were similar to uh, what I well, passing koans as I found out late, much later in life. Mm-hmm. That, uh, something that has a, a meaning, an unspeakable meaning, you know, that you just run to the end, you know, where you can't say or do anything more and you're already at a dead end. Yeah. And then something, and something happens, you know, there's some kind of new stage of meaning opens up in your mind. Mm. You know, when just nowhere else to go. Mm. Um, but then uh, that was in the spring of 66 yeah Mm -hmm. like in March or April of 66 and we just kept doing that until the summer and uh, that was my junior year in college and then 
my brother had already, Rick had already gone out to, he went, uh, he graduated that year from, from, um, uh, oh, the previous year he graduated from, uh, um, University of Vermont. And, uh, I was enjoying studying art so much that he did, he wanted to do it too. So, and, uh, San Francisco Art Institute was, um, cheap enough so that he, he just packed up and moved out to San Francisco and, yeah, and enrolled there. And just got you know got um, part time jobs and stuff like that. That he was always good at doing stuff like that. I was always scared to to be on my own because I I I always depended on him. We always thought in tandem because <laughs> we grew up very you know um, we were a year and a half apart and we were just always together as long as I could remember. That's very interesting because you're you're more talkative and more assertive in many ways than him from uh, the the from my observation. Uh, that's very interesting. Well, he's still you know he's still the hustler between us. You know, he comes up with jobs and things for me to do that that are very that I would never never do on my own. Wow, that's I really interesting. Huh. 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 Um. Anyways, uh, he had all he he was out in San Francisco, and um, I did, and somebody um, did you know Rob Gove? You knew Rob Gove. Oh yeah, sure. You remember him? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Rob Rob Gove was in um, in San Francisco Art Institute too at the same time, and. He told Rick uh, about Suzuki Roshi and took him up to to um, Bush Street, to Sokoji, and uh, Rick was very impressed with Suzuki Roshi mm. and told me about him, and I was excited about it too. So, you know, the, the summer of '66 was the, uh, the the year, the summer vacation of after my junior year. I I went out to well, California myself and started started going to um, Zen Center. And got the instructions from Katagiri Roshi. Yeah. And nobody um, could have been anybody. All he did was straighten my back and <laughs> pull my chin in. You know, he did. But uh, I was very impressed with Suzuki Roshi myself. I had never met anybody like him before. Mm. I just felt like he was the first person I ever met that didn't that wasn't trying to sell me anything. Mm. Mm. If you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Everybody always wants to convince you of their way of thinking or convince you of something about themselves, but he just seemed to be totally free from that. that those kind of, um, you know, that. that uh, craving that that's almost universal in the world mm. and uh, <clears throat> so I went back to Rhode Island School of Design and finished my senior year and I uh, that guy that Eng- the, that English teacher that I started that with had already gone, left his contract was up and I did Zaza on my own a little bit mm. and then uh, when you know, when I graduated, I went out to uh, back out to San Francisco. Rick was living in an a- apartment, a flat on in North Beach on Mason Street, with a bunch of other people. And I moved in there and rode my bicycle to uh, to Sokoji every morning. That's in '67. Yeah, after I graduated, that was in '67, mm-hmm. and um, that was the first the, the that summer. The first um, that was the first um, training period, wasn't it? Right in Sasahara. Right. Yeah. So I I stayed on all summer working and and going to Sokoji mm-hmm. every day. 
Mm -hmm. And then uh, they had a session in August. Yeah. So I was going to do that. And I was sitting there, and it was just, my legs were just horribly, horribly painful. Mm. And, uh, but I was trying to, um, been trying my best to, to sit there. And then suddenly there was, you know, I felt like a door, some doors opened up in my mind or something like that. And then I felt like there was a, it was possible to, to balance my mind. Mm. Now, where was this session? Sokoji on Bush Street. Yeah, right. And suddenly this, you know, this kind of powerful feeling came over me. And then, but as I, um, <laughs> as I was, that was right at the end of the day. And then I was, as I was walking out the door, I had this feeling that I wasn't coming back to finish that session. And when I arrived back at the apartment, they said there was a call from this woodworker that I had. His wife had, was my guitar student in this music store in, on Union Street mm. in, the, in the marina. And uh, I went in, and she asked me one day if I could handle woodworking tools and her, that her husband was a furniture maker and then and was looking for a, a, an assistant. So I said, yeah, I grew up working with woodworking tools. So I went in there and worked for one day, and then uh, he called up and hired me. So I had a job. Who? What was his name? His name was... Um, Rich Gaddy. And what was the name of the uh, uh, the place? Furniture by Gaddy. Yeah. And wasn't he over by Union Street somewhere? He was on Lombard. On Lombard. Mm -hmm. Lombard and what? Shopping. Oh, I can't remember. It was um, kind of midway between Van Ness and the Presidio. Uh huh. All right. All right. Uh huh. Very, very, very close to Fort Mason. Yeah. Right. That's. Yeah. I can just see it. Right. I can't. I can't remember the street. Yeah. A few streets. Um, what would it be? A few streets west of Golf. Uh. So what happened next? Because I remember you at Tassahara way back then. So. Yeah. Well, I went. Um, um, from the from the the time that um, the first training period was over, I went down for work weekends. Uh huh. And that's during one of those. That was a photograph that appears in um, in your crooked cucumber book. And it's on the it's all, front. All it's on us. the front. It's on the the home page of cuke dot com. And yeah, that was after the first training period is frequently used and called during the first training period. It is in Crooked Cucumber. That's wrong. I discovered later by talking to people like you and Nils yeah. who weren't at the first training period. No, that was after it. That was like, you know, October or something. September, late September, yeah. maybe. I, I went down there for a few training periods. and I mean, a few week work weekends and and. I mean, I was just passionate to go there. Yeah. I, I was totally driven. Uh, and, you know, it was hard and scary, but I just really wanted to to do that. So I only I only worked at the the woodworking shop for a few months, and, which I thought was a long time. It was the only real job, the first job I ever had in my life, really. Hmm. And uh, the first real job, but working for like two or three months is uh, seemed like forever for me. Mm. But, um, so I went down to uh, when the training period started. Mm -hmm. I went down. 
Wayne State. And I think Rick Rick took my place at the, the um, at Furniture by Gaddy. Uh uh-huh. And you went to I guess that would be the spring of sixty eight practice period. No, it was the fall of fall of sixty uh, seven. There wasn't a practice period then. Uh, so you were just there in the fall of 67. It was like a practice period, but it wasn't called one. We we had just had one, you know, in the summer. Right. I can't remember exactly, but I, I think I did do Tongario and stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was just like a practice period. That's I remember you from back then. I, I knew you were there. Uh, so how long did you stay? Um. I stayed, I had to go back to the city in the, like, January of 68 to go, to take, get my, um, induction, take my induction physical, uh, physical at, uh, Ocean, Oakland Induction Center. Yeah, I had that work I, out. I managed to get out of that. Mm-hmm. I, uh. That's a whole other story. That's an interesting story. Oh, let's hear it. Let's hear it. I just, I put on, I had these, this set of union underwear that I, <laughs> I shaved my head and I, I wore this you, 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 uh, set of union underwear with a bum flap. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and I, deliberately dirtied it all up and then it, I, you know and everybody was staring at me and it just re- really helped me uh, put 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 myself in the you know um, in uh, the right frame of mind yeah. or the wrong frame of mind as the case may be I discovered that the ego has two sides to it right it has a, a bright side and a dark side the bright side is what what you want to be, yeah, and you, what you want people to think that you are, and the dark side is what you're you're afraid you are. <laughs> uh huh. Uh-huh. You know, and you have bad dreams about being. Well, I realize that you can, you know, when you're in a jam, you can, you know, you can draw on the dark side of the ego and make yourself into, um, you know, the person that you're most afraid, secretly afraid that you are. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with you. Or uh, I approached getting out of there sort of like drama. Uh, and I would, I, I advise people on how to get out of the uh, being uh, inducted. I said, you know, find somebody in yourself they don't want you to be, you know, or find a way to, to act that, to be that. Uh, yeah. And just become it. And freak them out as much as you can. Dick Baker did that. Yeah, but um, I, I, those people see all kinds of people day in and day out. And if you're just acting and you're holding back, you know, you're 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 holding back your pride and you're just making an act. They're going to see right through you. Hey, acting is not a good acting. Is not holding back. Yeah, well, I wasn't a, 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 a real actor. Yeah. You know, so I couldn't have done that. Yeah. Maybe you could. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, it, it would have been... <laughs> I, I, I was uh, uh, I was an extra in a movie one time. Oh, that's cool. In Japan? Yeah, in, in Japan. Yeah. And it, it, was, it was this movie about uh, um, Tojo Hideki. In the uh, war crimes, war crimes tri- tribunals. Oh, and uh, I played the um, the French judge. I had no lines. I, I was just, you know, it was just an extra. I just sat there. I put, but I was the French judge and the uh, of on the the panel, and uh, the chief judge was played by Ronnie Cox. The um, that played the. The bad guy in RoboCop. Oh, cool! Yeah, RoboCop, and also played the the Emperor of Mars in uh, 
in uh, Total Recall, that Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. Oh, yeah, movie. yeah. Very good. <laughs> and uh, I, I spent a long time talking with him. He was, he was interesting. Because yeah. there was you know, all this, they were only shooting with one camera, so there was a, a lot of waiting time between shots while they set up uh -huh. the shot. So um, I spent a lot of time talking with him, and I, I asked him about about what, what, would, what about method acting, and he was telling me about what method acting was all about. And I, you know, I told him that uh, my only experience like that was when I had when was when I had to take my uh, induction physical for during the Vietnam War, and he mm -hmm. got a kick out of slap me on my knee. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, that was that was that was exactly it. Yeah, that kind of method in a way. Yeah. But I was, but I could see other guys. You know, I mean, this is right in the, the the you know the height of the hate Ashbury, right? Right. And everybody was trying to get out. But yeah. I could see other people that were you know that were um, tr trying to pretend to be gay or something like that. But you could, you, I could see through them. You know, you could see somewhere they were holding back. I mean, they were, they were, they were, they were hanging on to their pride. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, but for me, I just made myself into this worm. <laughs> that I, <laughs> That's great. Anyways, they, they 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 sent me to the psychiatrist. I had to go back to the psychiatrist, and a few days later, and and um, he was pretty sympathetic. He, lo he looked like a kind of a, a, a total pushover. Yeah. So he said, uh, "I didn't have to go go in the army." So I got a one F and then a one Y later on. Four F. 4F, yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. But uh, that experience, I mean, it took me a couple of weeks to get over that. <laughs> you know? Uh -huh. I was in a state of depression for like for two weeks after I did that to myself. Oh, wow. That, that wow. was a really interesting psychological experiment. When I went back to. Um, Tassahara went back to Tassahara with Dick Baker. And I stayed until how much longer? I can't remember. I remember you were in the front room in the dorm. Yeah. And and we later we turned that room into a, a toilet room. Cuz we had to you remember we had to we had to go across the the little path there to the Toilet, sort of public toilet in the back of the cabin across the way there. Did we? Yeah. I can't when you were there, that that's the room that became the the. It had toilets and sinks, and it had a toilet and maybe just one sink. And it, there were then I think there were then there were nine rooms uh, in there. But I that was my, that was uh, yeah, the other. Um, that was the room that was um, that stucco building that with us. Yeah, the dining called? room, the dining room below. That was the dining room below. Was I was I in the front room? I couldn't remember whether I was in the front room or the second room. Well, yeah, I could be wrong. Good Lord, sure. Uh, you were you were up front. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, um, I when I, I a few years ago. I went back down there with Rick for the first time and since those days. Uh huh. Oh wow. And I really wanted to see that room again because it was facing the wall in that room that I had, you know, the greatest experience of my life. So I just wanted to see that wall again, and I was really um, sad to see the whole building had changed. It was all rebuilt. But it was rebuilt to look the same, and a lot, and a lot of the old stuff was kept. But the, uh, uh, yeah, they re you know it cost over a million dollars to rebuild it. Uh, no kidding. Yeah, I I took um, I escorted, uh, I guess Michael Winger and Linda Cutts to talk to Jonathan Altman about it, 
in, uh, you know, who's a big donor in Santa Fe. And Jonathan said, well, when I was at Tassajara, we did all the work, you know. We did everything. We we built the new kitchen, and yeah. well, times had changed. I was happy to see that um, the, the kitchen cabinets that I made were still there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. That's great. So tell us about the most important experience of your life in that room. Well, um, there was, uh, after I went, went to Tassajara to live at Tassajara, I had, you know, started having, um, this powerful experience during, in August during session there. And that was cut cut off because I had to start work. I, you know, I was, I had to go to work at this woodworking shop because I was mm-hmm. desperate to have a, uh, desperate to have a job. And, uh, then, uh, I went to Tassajara and then there was a, an, another session was, uh, Rohatsu. It was Rohatsu. Um, the same thing happened again. In December. Right. So, yeah. For, uh, during during the the same thing started exactly the same thing started happening again and I was able to see it all the way through <clears throat> this time mm-hmm. and uh, I told Suzuki Roshi about it and you know he 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 during Dokusan and he he didn't say anything, and then I told him that um, I thought doing zazen was like standing on your head. It's very easy to do, but you can't do it very long. Hmm. And then, you know, he just uh, he just nod his head, and not say anything. And then during the evening evening lecture, he would say, "Now oh, somebody told me that zazen was like standing on your head." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He said, this is very true. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like yeah. to, I, you know, <clears throat> if the t- tapes exist of those lectures, I'd love to hear hear it again. Uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, you know, I have them all. All the existing lectures are on shunyusuzuki.com. Everything that survived, all the audio, and, and many transcripts without audio. Uh so we could just look at uh, 1967 December, but a lot of the 67 tapes were lost, uh, or uh, I don't know. Yeah, but we might have that. I I don't know. I could tell. I mean, I could look it up in a second. And you could too. Just go to shunyusuzuki dot com. I tried to, and then uh, one time. And it said that tapes were available, but I didn't know how to find them. Oh, it's not very hard, really. You just go to uh, the, all right, you go to com, right? And then you yeah. go, it, it might, we might still have a door first. Then you click on the door, you go in. Then it says lecture search form right up top. Oh. And you click on that. And then you go, uh, uh, you can search by, you know, any number of criteria, keywords, including date, uh, uh, year, uh, subject, uh, all sorts of things. And you click on it. So uh, uh, yeah, th- there's also uh, there's charts, you know, where you can just go down the dates. There's, you know, various ways. It, it's uh, well, I'll, to, do, I'll look I'll look into that again and see see if I can figure it out this time. Yeah, well, I can go there right now while you're talking. So tell us more about about uh, what was happening. I remember you working in the shop there. Yep, I, I was. Yeah. I don't know if I was making the cabinets already in those days. I was such a child, but I think back and 
these tremendous earth-shaking things were happening to me. But on, on the other hand, I was, I was just this young kid, you know, with all of these hang-ups and stuff. Mm-hmm. 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 Boy, what a time that was, though, God. Yeah, yeah. We were so lucky. Yeah, indeed. But anyways, um, I had that my um, my experience was like like the ones that Caplow talks about in his you know three pillars of Zen that that, that sort of thing. Mm. Yeah, uh, but um, I thought it was permanent, and, and um, Suzuki Roshi never told, never said it's going to go away. You know, I thought, oh, I made it. But I thought that everybody, you know, I thought that you know that that Dick and Peter and you know all all the the main people had already uh, had all already had the same experience, but uh, but I guess not. <laughs> I just thought. I just thought that this this is what happens to you when you're sitting. Well, it's hard to know what's happening with other people. Yeah, but Suzuki Roshi said when you know at that the, that time, like the three pillow three pillars of Zen um, was 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 uh, really popular. Every that was being handed around uh, in those days, and, and uh, Suzuki Roshi said. Uh, in one of those lectures during Ruhatsu, he said that uh, uh, you hear about people having enlightenment experiences as well. We have them here too. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, anyways, um, after a session, it just started going away, and, and I started going back to my normal self and. Which is the last thing I ever wanted to be, ever ever wanted to have happen to me. And uh, incidentally, all it uh, looks like all those Sassine lectures are there. Ah, there's a whole bunch of December. I uh, like here we are, December. Uh, I'm just looking, sixty-seven dash twelve dash o one dash a, o one b, o two. O four B. See, there's O four B. Looks like they're missing some there because he gives sometimes two in a day. O four A, O five A, O five B, here's one. O six A, O six B, Shosan ceremony for it. Uh and then we go to the 14th, and that's the last one. So there's a whole bunch there. And there's transcripts, there's light edits, there's uh, there's um, usually uh, more than one uh, audio version. Um, okay. SuzukiLoshi.com? No, ShunYuSuzuki.com. I don't use the word Roshi. There's a zillion Suzuki Roshis. It's like saying Mr. Suzuki. <laughs> yeah. uh, but there ain't a zillion Shunyus. Although I found a Shunyu Suzuki in Texas. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I wondered if he was named for our Shunyu. Hmm. Anyway, all right. So where were you there? Door. Yeah, click on There's the door. door. Hey, you you can do this. Knock on the gate. Yeah, just click on it. Click on the door. Yeah, it's okay, a link. There it is. Oh. It's a link. Nice. And then what do you do? See, it says lecture search form. Very big letters right up top.
I don't see lectures for search form. Shunyu Suzuki lecture search form. If you oh, hit, I see Shun. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Complete and up to date presentation of transcripts. It should say transcripts and audio. It says Sunu Suzuki Lecture Search Form for all transcripts with links and edited versions, audio and video files, 448 partial and completely. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that's right. So you click on the link. The link is the is what? the um, Where it says Sunu Suzuki Lecture Search Form, it's purple. Well, mine is brown. Well, brown will do. Okay. There it is. All right. I got it. So you go in there okay. and you, you can find it from there. Just write, just write 67 dash in that where it says keywords, write 67 dash 12. And you'll get all of them from December in 67 when you just hit enter. But you can do that at another time. <laughs> Yeah, I will. No, I just, I already, I already bookmarked the page, so I'm all, I'm all set now. Thank you very much. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. Uh, I started having anxiety. I was so desperately trying to hold on to that experience of um, uh, that I had during session that I started having this anxiety attack uh, <laughs> trying to hold on to it yeah and I told told Suzuki Roshi about you know my feeling I had never had an anxiety attack before I didn't know what it was they uh -huh. didn't have words for stuff like that in those days you know yeah and uh, I told tried to explain to Suzuki Roshi what was happening to me he says he said, hmm. he said, have you been working on a koan? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Which kind of amazed me. Where would I where where would I have gotten a koan to work on? I barely even knew knew what Zen was. Mm -hmm. I had read um, Alan Watts's. Uh, What's the name of that book? The, the, the Way of Zen? The Way of Zen, yeah. It didn't mean a single thing to me. It was just like nonsense. <laughs> and, I, and I, so I, you know, I didn't, um, the only thing that, <laughs> the only reason that I started practicing Zazen is because Suzuki Roshi was, was so um, convincing. Mm -hmm. And and uh, no nonsense, you know. Yeah. Interesting, you say convincing because you also said he's the first person you ever met that wasn't trying to convince you of anything, really. Is yeah, <laughs> which is why 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 he was so convincing. Yeah. I had never met anybody like that before in my life. Yeah. That I uh, have heard that I swear from hundreds of people. Yeah, I'm sure you have. Yeah. Well, and um, I found out since then that that was a trait to be found in good Zen masters. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <clears throat> Um, anyways, that's so. After that, um, I had to. I got my uh, got called up to uh, to take my physical, and the, and I went up to. So I went back to the uh, to the city and took my physical and got over that and went back down down again. And then after that, it's just um, zazen just kept getting stronger and stronger for me. And I just like this powerful feeling um, was growing and growing and growing. I just felt like it was going something. It was leading somewhere. It had to, had to lead somewhere. And uh, then the next big experience I had, 
the next important experience I had. I was just during um, the session in, I think it was in April, the beginning of um, training period. Uh, no, 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 no. April is the end of training period. Wasn't there a training period? Isn't there a training period that lasts from April, May, and June? No, no. After the first summer, which was July and August, they all were uh, like mid or late September through mid December uh, or uh, late January, uh, say early February through April, February, March, April, mm, January, February, March, mid January through mid April. Uh, well, anyways, it was it was really cold, and you know, people used to cl climb up to places where there was a little bit of sun in the morning after breakfast or something. Well, you're talking about December, January, February, you know, late October to you know, uh, mid February, March. That's the way it was then. Yeah, well, some, it was it was pretty pretty cold at that time still, whatever. Right, and then, right. Uh, so my brother and I were up on, my brother is back down there again for that. And there was that flat area where there, there's some kind of building there now, but um, there was that flat area up on, up above the uh, the old Zendo. You cl climb up the hill where you get a little bit of sunlight anyways up there. And uh, oh, I, yeah. was, I was yeah. sitting up there and, it just started. I started thinking that um, why is it? Uh, why do people just their effort goes up and down and up and down all the time? You know, when they're um, when, you know when they're uh, excited about it, and you know they they practice real hard, and then when their excitement goes down, then they they slack off and daydream. I thought, why is it necessary to do that? Why not? Why not just sit, regardless? Mm -hmm. Just do something totally independent of these feelings of desire and you know and uh, you know, excitement and you know what I mean? Yeah, you sure. Know. That's what Suzuki taught. Yeah, our, yeah you know well, that's we, we, that's the basic teaching in writing and art too. Yeah. You why, know, I, you don't know. wait for inspiration. Do it. Just keep doing it. You know, I thought. I just thought. Well, why, 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 why can't we just? Why can't I just sit the same way, whether I want to or not? And it was kind of a, it was yeah. a big breakthrough to me. You know, it was kind of like thinking outside of beyond desire. And um, so after that, my zazen uh, it improved improved my zazen a real lot. And yeah, I wasn't just sitting hard when I felt like it, and then then uh, slacking off when I didn't. I just just, just yeah. made up my mind that I was just going to sit the same way, regardless of how I felt. That was a yeah. kind of a breakthrough to me, and then um, then the. Feeling this feeling in my sauce and just kept getting stronger and stronger and stronger, uh, and I just would take every opportunity to sit that I could, you know, and when every every time that um, I had a little time off or anything like that, I would I would do zaza. And then finally, in in June, uh, on a four or nine day, I was supposed to go on a hike with Peter and. And uh, Peter Schneider and and um, yeah and um, Rob Gold. We were going to climb up that mountain. Um, above. You mean Flag Rock? Yeah, above. Not the one with the horse pasture on it, but the, the the real tall pointed one right across the right above Toss. Flag Rock. Yeah, is that what it's called? Yeah. yeah. We we're going to climb up there. But um, those guys had some responsibilities that they had to take care of. We had our bag lunches and everything like that. I had to wait for them, so I went.
went into my room in the in the the front of the stone room there and that room we were talking about and I sat down on my bed and just started um, looking at the wall staring at the wall and doing zazen and then I saw <clears throat> Um, this circle of light that like, like a um, uh, like a I think I told you about this before one time but uh, this is like a uh, looked like a glowing um, soap bubble appeared on the wall in front of mm. me and so and I had the feeling like this was my mind like a voice told me that 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 was my mind that I was looking at and then, um, you know, after a few seconds, it started rising. And when it when it went above my head, then everything, um, in a way, everything disappeared. Like, hmm. you know, everything looked the same. I mean, you know, my bed and the wall and everything exactly looked the same, but it was empty. It didn't have anything, you know. It was it didn't have any existence anymore. It was just like um, yeah. it was, they were just like um, a play of light. No, no, mm. no, no in, in, inner existence. Nothing you could hold on to, or nothing you could touch, feel, taste, think about. It was a well, reality that was. And it wasn't it wasn't an ecstatic experience or anything like that, but it was very, um, very believable. I mean, it was it wasn't like any kind of uh, drug experience or anything that I had ever experienced before. It was wasn't really an experience. It was just a way of uh, a new way of seeing everything. Yeah. Essentially, um, reality was different. And then, uh, hmm. then I, I thought something something really had happened. So, anyways, I went on a hike with um, with with Peter and, and uh, Rob, and everything went on and. Uh, <clears throat> But what, every time I, I would do zazen, then that that would, I would get back there again, like right at the usually right at the end of the period, you know, like for the last five minutes or ten minutes, it would, I, I would get back in that that feeling where that that experience would come back again. Mm-hmm. But um, that evening, I went to see um, Chino Sensei. Or, Chino Otagawa Roshi. Now, um, and told him about it, and I, I had no idea what this, what was happening. I didn't know what, what all this was about. And I, and I, you know, I, I told him about it, and he said, he said, oh well, you know, you, you, uh, lots of things happen to you when you're, you know, when you're just starting off in zazen, but you don't. You shouldn't pay attention to them and uh, just keep practicing. And then he went on to describe how zazen should be. And when you're doing zazen, you know, like you, this feeling, there should be energy like, like circulating throughout your entire body and everything. The way he described it was exactly what happened to me, what was happening to me. And I said, well, uh, I said, I, you know, whether you believe me or not, uh, everything you said is just exactly what I'm experiencing, you know. And f- finally, he he said, well, uh, in that case, you you know, so you 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 will never have any problems again. <laughs> well, I've had plenty of problems, but not 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 Zaza in Zaza. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So, anyways, that that was, uh, and and that is, you know, basically been my practice since the since that time. That was June of '68, and it's just mm. I just you know went on to you know to uh, master it really. Mm. Now, um, 
Now I feel it all the time, whether I'm doing zazen or not. It just says uh, when I do mm. zazen, it's just more intense. Is all. <clears> hmm. <throat> <clears throat> So, what happened then? Well, I decided that um, I had to go to Japan. I wanted to go to Japan, and I started thinking about that. And I went back to the city and and uh, went back to work at the same place, trying to save up some money and stuff like that. I'm bugging Suzuki Roshi about finding a way to go to Japan. I just bothered everybody so much in those days. I feel sorry about that. <laughs> that was, huh? What What do you mean? I was so Im- impatient. Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, and Suzuki Roshi, of course, had, had his hands full. But anyways, um, I was always too much of a coward to go to Japan on my own. But after Sally went there and came back, then uh, my main reason. Now, who's who's Sally? Sally Block. <laughs> oh, I know who she is, but uh, uh, was she your girlfriend? Yeah, we we were married. Oh, we were married. All right, we were married for thirteen years. Uh, what what year did you get married? We got married um, seventy two, I think. Right after Suzuki Roshi died. Oh, really? Huh. So? I think my main main reason for marrying her was that I needed needed somebody to help me go to Japan. I was just such a coward to do it on my own. <laughs> and she wanted to go to Japan. Well, she, had all, she already went to that nunnery in Nagoya. That Remember, what's her name? That, that, Jap- that nun that... Yoshida. Yeah. And she she couldn't stand it there, so she ran away from there, and she went went to Antaiji. I don't know how she knew about Antaiji in Kyoto, and she really liked it there because that's all they did. All yeah. they did was Zazen. They didn't, you know, in the, that nunnery where she was with Yo, Yoshida Roshi, they didn't do hardly any Zazen. They just went around serving tea to people and, you know, and sewing okesas and laksus and this and that. And, and, you know, Sally thought that this was just a bunch of nonsense. She wanted to really sit. So she ran away from, she yeah. ran, ran away from there and went to, to Antaiji where they sat really intensely. Yeah. And then she came back and we got married and, a couple of years later, we went. So um, we went there and uh, sat at Antaiji until. Yeah. But um, Uchiyama Roshi um, retired after a, a year, a couple of years. Hmm. Um, and then they they uh, eventually they moved up to um, where they are now up in the Japan seaside. Yeah. So. Do you know why they did that? I've never understood why they did that. Um, I'm not quite sure myself, but they sold Antaiji. Well, you know, had a, a very very, very valuable piece of land it was sitting on, but Antaiji had no parishioners. Mm. They had no danka. Yeah. That's why they had to live by takuhatsu, by begging. Uh, oh, they did takuhatsu. Oh, yeah. That's how they survived. And they, so it, it wasn't uh, ceremonial takuhatsu. It was the real thing. Yeah. 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 No, they were they that they, they survived that, and they had they had places that knew them from years ago. There were parts of Kyoto that that who who knew where the uh, where 
all the people there, all the shop shop owners and everybody knew who they were, and that and knew that they depended on that to live. So they would get enough money doing takahatsu to survive, plus vegetables mm. and other things. Yeah, I can understand why they didn't have danka because they, 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 it was really it was called a zazen only temple and. The Danka want memorial services and uh, yeah, stuff like that. Was that um, Which, I don't know. Um, I can't remember what uh, what the story was, but whether whether uh, Sawaki Kodo founded that himself. But the building was just uh, reassembled from the you uh, know some old temple building from. Not a prefecture was brought up there and rebuilt on that. Yeah. Um, from the beginning, it was just a Zazen temple. Yeah. Without any, um, you know, responsibilities to Danka, any, any yeah. dead business, as yeah. called it. Uh, yeah. So after um, Uchiyama, Though she retired, he had um, tuberculosis, so he was, you know, he was not so well. Yeah. Well, he lived decades longer. Yeah, he lived quite a bit longer, as it turned out. But he was actually married to somebody that um, his wife lived somewhere nearby. And, uh, and she took care of him after he retired. He moved down to the, the yeah. Uji area. Yeah. Uh, I dropped, I, I was, some monks took me to his house to introduce me to him in 1988. Yeah. And he wasn't feeling well, so we we couldn't. But uh, Graham Petchy continued seeing him, oh my God, into this century, you know? Oh, no. He didn't, uh, leave. he didn't live into this century. Definitely not. He went. I remember Graham going and seeing him. Was that? Was it that long ago? Uh, um. Uh, did you? Um, um, Okumura Shohaku has um, a nice interview on on YouTube. Have you heard that? It's called uh, A Good for Nothing Life. Oh, that'd be good. Yeah, I've, I've done a podcast with him. Uh, uh, I'm in touch with him. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll look into that. I'll put, I have a page for him. Yeah. I'll, I'll well, link to that. It, it's a very nice, uh, a nice interview. The stuff he says is good. And uh, his comments about American Zen now are good to his critique yeah and um, but he, he yeah he, Uchiyama died in 1998 1998 that late yeah March 13th I'll be darned oh no when maybe he was born on March 13th no no he died on March 13th he was born in 1912 yeah, Graham, Graham stayed close with him. He'd always see him when he went there. It was his second teacher. Yeah. I, uh, I met Graham a few times. So what year did you go to Japan? 73. Mar Mar 73. March 17, 1973. I oh. landed in Yokohama. Yeah. And uh, you and Sally, uh, she, you all were together there for twelve years, or yeah. Um, and then she went back to America or something, right? Yeah, and I stayed. Yeah, and and so, uh, uh, so that would be like eighty five. Oh, and then I met you there in eighty eight. Uh, Huh. Hmm. 
And you you taught. What did you you said you were teaching? What did you teach? Well, I just taught English. Yeah. At university. Yeah. I, I I mean everybody yeah. just teaches English, you know. And I I taught I've taught taught. I know. In high schools, and language <laughs> schools, and finally, and then I worked for ten years in a um, a company that made dental equipment, doing translation. Oh, uh huh. Um, which is very good for my re- reading Japanese. Yeah. And. Um, yeah. But after the the. Uh, that was back when the the yen um, suddenly went became very much more expensive in the in the yeah. uh, up up until the maybe the early eighties or something like that. It was the uh, the yen was like three hundred to a dollar. Yeah, and this suddenly it you know the the value of the yen was um, doubled, Tr- tripled. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> tripled. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, anyway. When I was there, I'd say it went from, oh, 120 to 165 uh, in 88 to 92. I mean, that's off the top of my head what I remember. It was great, man. Yeah. Uh, We were making tons of money and not working that much. Well, I... um, Sending it back. Yeah, I... uh, but my my income <laughs> uh, vastly increased. My the dollar value of my income went way way up. Yeah, right. And, uh, it was hard for companies. The company I was working for, you know, their, the the cost of their products went way way up. So they they weren't um, able to export as much. So uh, I wasn't. Uh, my job got harder. <laughs> they were getting more strict. Uh, so yeah. they weren't, they weren't letting me have as much freedom as I, they had, you know, that I had been enjoying earlier. Yeah. Anyways, um, after, um, Uchiyama Roshi, uh, retired and, and, um, Antaiji sold that land and bought that piece of land way up in the mountains and near, near the Japan Sea in, in Hyogo, mm-hmm. Hyogo Prefecture near Totori. Um, I had to find somewhere else to sit, so I sat a little bit with uh, Morinaga Roshi at uh, Daishuin, and um, then somebody recommended um, Hoshinji and Obama. And Hara, oh, Hara yeah. Seke Roshi. So I started yeah. going up there, and I went up there. Uh, I did all their sessions up there for about six years, and that was wonderful. wow. So Hara Roshi became probably the the, uh, the second most, you know, after Suzuki Roshi, my 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 second teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was an extremely important experience to me. Mm, yeah. yeah, he was. Um, I had a tremendous respect for him, and uh, well, then eventually, um, you know, my, Sally went back to America, and I uh, was rudderless for a little while, and then then I went to the Philippines with uh, uh, some friends and met a girl down there. We got married and stayed married to her for. Oh. Stayed married to her for, well, you know, for I don't know. Thirteen or fourteen years, fifteen. I don't know. Oh yeah, I remember her. Yeah, I can't remember her name. Joy. Joy, right, right, right. And what happened then? Before Sally went back, I started sitting at. Um, we moved. She, she, we lived for a couple of years in um, in Kobe, and she was going to sit and start practicing with Yamada Mumong. And then, oh yeah, Yamada, is that right? Yamada Mumong became uh, con, uh, Kancho of um, 
Myoshinji in Kyoto, which is very near to our house. So we yeah. moved back to... Um, I'm getting confused. Anyways, we ended up moving back to Kyoto and um, and sitting at... Um, she was practicing with him. No, that's before we... Uh, Okay, okay, okay. Here goes. Now I remember. Um, we were, we <laughs> were. Um, she started uh, practicing with uh, going, going to Myoshinji and studying with the Amada Momon. Um, when right. He became con- uh, moved back to Kyoto, and then after he died, um, we moved to to Kobe, and she was practicing with with the guy who his main disciple that took over the temple that he used to be at in, in Kobe. Do you remember what it's called? Nope, I can't. <laughs> I can't remember yeah. it all. I was never even there. I never even went there one time. It was hurt by the earthquake that happened, I don't know, so that was, 20 that years was, ago. That was quite a bit later, yeah. Yeah. But anyways, we moved back to, to Kyoto, and she started. We uh, she started practicing with Fukushima Loshi when he took out when he moved into um, Tofukuji in Kyoto. So he was like in o- Okayama before. Oh. Huh. And then uh, so we moved in that, that, and that's how I wound up living in that neighborhood. And that's the neighborhood I lived in until I. Until a couple of years ago, when I came back here, mm-hmm. to Fukuji. But uh, Fukushima, mm-hmm. I, I I practiced and I did practice, did koans with with um, Fukushima Roshi for about five years or so, and then when I mm. and then when I married Joy, I stopped going there and sort of dropped out from formal Zen altogether. Hmm. Sitting on my own, I had the stupid idea to try to make furniture in the Philippines. God, I did some, had a lot of fun, but did a lot of interesting things. But uh, it was a dumb idea. Uh huh. Uh-huh. But I got a, we built all kinds of stuff down there. All these big buildings, and I shipped woodworking equipment and everything down there. It's all still there. Yeah. I remember you saying to me back in Japan that Joy went back to the Philippines some and you were sending her mother money there. And then something like this, you went to visit her there and you found out you'd like been supporting like this whole extended family or something like that. Is that true? Well, I didn't find out. I mean, I was I I knew everything all all along. There was nothing. Oh, I you see. Know, there was I see. Nothing. Um, I didn't do anything that I didn't. But I I got along very well with her family, and I still love them. They're, yeah. they're wonderful people. I just yeah. still consider them my own family. Ah. Uh, we uh. stay in touch. Hmm. Mm. But I can't help them anymore because they don't have any money. Yeah. Ah. Uh, well, um, that's quite a trajectory your life has taken. Uh, is um, there anything you'd like to uh, conclude with? Yeah. I'm sitting with a group of people here, but um, in Rutland, and it's a, a small group, but. Um, they're all old people back from our day, you know. There's no young people, and um, yeah, I think the state of affairs here in Zen is kind of pretty disappointing in in America now, in a way, um, because uh, as Shohaku says, he, he says in that. Um, a good for nothing life. He, he says that they, uh, 
Americans should should um, maintain good connections with Japan because they're just um, starting to follow their own ideas. Yeah, and um, it's kind of um, you know the both sides of the political spectrum here in America are, are taking on this religious uh, character. And um, Zen has become um, involved in the, or lefties are using Zen as a vehicle for their progressive um, social agenda. Uh huh. Uh-huh. I've noticed that. <laughs> And, you know, it's all, they, they just assume that Zen and environmentalism and all the, in the, all, all of this pop psychology and everything is all all on the same page, but it's not. Zen is something entirely yeah. different. Yeah. Um, and they yeah. don't realize that. that they, everybody wants to be something, you know. They practice Zen for years, and they, they want to be something. And there's, every Tom, Dick, and Harry now is a Roshi. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's some really good people, nice people in the, in our group, but it's a very low low uh, low energy group because everybody's old. And then, Corona, then the COVID nineteen came on and came by and really screwed things up. Does Does the group have a name? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> All right. Is there a teacher? No. Uh huh. Uh huh. I see. But none of the so it's just a group of yeah. But none, not like some of the people are uh, uh, several of the the more the more serious quote unquote people, or they they think of themselves as serious, um, are connected with this place outside of Middlebury near to. College, and that's um, connected with um, the guy there that, that's running that place is uh, a follower of Bernie Glassman, right? And right into that sort of thing, sitting on sidewalks and you know, and getting involved in this social. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he did. He did a session at Auschwitz or something like that. Yeah, which I which I strongly disagree with. That whole, yeah. that whole idea of and this guy that's up there. It's called um, is it bread bread loaf. Anyways, it's bread bread loaf. There's a mountain bread loaf mountain. So there's a there's a mountain there called bread loaf. And. Yeah, Middlebury College also has facilities out there. Uh, they have some other name for it too. Mm -hmm. But um, the guy there that's uh, the, the most, uh, that's their their teacher, the the follower of Bernie Glassman, uh, mm -hmm. doesn't. I I feel he doesn't doesn't know anything about Zen at all. The stuff that he says is nonsense to me. He's a real nice guy. <laughs> He's a real nice guy. Uh -huh. I, I like him as a person. He's quite sincere and everything, but um, he doesn't seem to understand the practice at all. And uh, uh -huh. I, you know, and I, I uh, the other thing that bothers another another strange the thing that I find extremely strange is this obsession with lineage but they have it yeah right now that you're I'm sure you're aware of yeah yeah I've I've benefited from it <laughs> yeah but I I run away from that I, I you know if somebody says what's your lineage I say well I've descended from George Morton of Plymouth Colony I refuse to talk Oh, that's cool. I refuse. That's cool. I refuse to talk about the teachers that I studied under because I uh -huh. because I, I think it's a, a, nobody's concerned about limit lineage in Japan. It's never nobody talks about it. The word is unknown. But um, here in America, it's I feel it's um, 
due to um, anxiety about authenticity, about one's authenticity, and um, yeah, I, I, and I think there, you know, people have very good reason to be anxious about their authenticity because there's there's very little of it around. I'm not so happy about the, you know, the, in a way, well, it's good that people are sitting. You know, on, on one hand, it's it's nice that people are sitting, but you know, um, if you don't know anything and you think think you know it, that's not good. If you don't know any, if you don't know anything and you and you know you don't know anything, that's beginner's mind. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah, that's a nice place to be. Yeah. <laughs> but people people want to be something. You know, they want to. They want identity. Yeah, right. Yeah, identity. Uh, there's a lot of identity Zen. Yeah. Uh, engaged Buddhism is very big. I call engaged Buddhism Buddhism, which is engaged with things you're interested in. Yeah. Yeah, well, I always, you know, I like to ask that guy up at Bread Loaf. I said, well, if a bunch of people with, with red MAGA hats came around and wanted you to teach them zazen, what, what would you do? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, well, it shouldn't matter. Yeah. But it would matter to them because, I mean, for them it's, you know, it's like um, a contradiction in terms. Mm. Well. Because they're, they're, they, they believe that, the, you know, the, the, the they believe that Zen, Zen and the uh, progressive social agenda are on the same track. Yeah. Well, for and and also people are. Um, it's a very long story. I mean, I, I I could write if I could write books. I could write a whole. I tried I tried write, doing a lot of writing, but I couldn't. Never could bring myself to finish uh -huh. anything. Well, you can expound on it now. The thing that I feel is most positive in the world right now is um, the growing um, idea that um, re rejection of, of scientific materi materialism and the growing idea that um, that reality is uh, of the nature of consciousness. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the guy, the guy who's thinking I find most, uh, I mean, he, the guy that I think that, that re really gets to the heart of the matter better than anybody else is um, this guy by the name of uh, Bernardo Castrop. Have you heard of him? Ber uh, let me write this down. All right. Ber uh, Bernardo Castro? Cast Castrop. Bernardo, uh, K A S T R O P, T R U P, I think. Uh huh. Hmm. There's lots of lots of stuff on um, on YouTube of his. Double check here. Yeah, you know um, when you say scientific materialism. Uh, the, to me, the uh, uh, there is no uh, conflict uh, with science and the way, you know. No, I feel the same. Yeah, uh, it's uh, people think that that this this um, I don't know what to call it. Uh, that they think this uh, materialistic. Um, uh, it's actually a sort of literalism, uh, materialistic, you know, that they're into facts, right? <laughs> yeah. And, but um, Bernardo Castro, is, his basic idea is, is that, that um, reality is of the nature of thought, which is fundamental to Buddhism. Right, right. It's, inescap it's inescapable in Buddhism. Right. That's what my father thought. That's what my father said. I grew up around that. Yeah. Um, yeah, but his, uh, he's, uh, he's, um, 
he's got a two PhDs. One is one is in in uh, uh, computer science or something like that. He's an engineer, and he's also got a PhD in philosophy. Uh huh. He listened to some of his lectures. They're very very good. Hmm. All right. He's not that old. He's only uh, maybe in his forties. Where Where's he from? Um. I think he was born and grew up in Brazil, but he's Dutch, and now he's living in in uh, in the Netherlands or 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 Belgium, teaching there. I like his thinking very much, but and he's very much aware of you know the uh, you know the connection with with uh, Eastern spiritualism. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. But um, the thing about his ideas is that they're um, they're so clear. Yeah. But he oh no he says that he he disclaims he, he says that he's he says that uh, you know was that uh, practitioners Buddhist practitioners and so forth are able to actually experience it you know but for him as an intellectual conclusion. Uh -huh. I do experience, but he doesn't feel like he does. But there's a few um, <clears throat> and he there's a lot of lots and lots of um, lectures and interviews and podcasts and stuff on YouTube with him, and some of them include people who are very very convincing um, teachers and like in Europe. Mm -hmm. That people that really seem to understand the nature of Zen practice. Mm. Mm. Check it out. I mean, he's definitely somebody you should know about. All right. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Sounds good. Well. Um, yeah, but I I appreciate the things you had to say here. Uh, I'm sorry about. I that. wish I were more. I wish I were more eloquent. <laughs> no, you're plenty eloquent. Um, I'm just going to say I'm sorry about the state of Zen. Yeah, but I mean, people here are not to blame for it. They said there aren't any teachers. Mm. Um, people that are that in my group don't don't see me as a teacher because I don't. I rejected the uh, you know the traditional Zen. Uh, you know, priest. I'm not. I don't believe in the priesthood. I have. I don't. I don't think it belongs in America at all. Mm -hmm. I think the whole the whole idea. This is going down. You know, it's going to disappear in Japan. So why bother instituting it here? Uh huh. Uh huh. You know. Uh huh. Zen. You know, this is not. The Buddha wasn't a wasn't a priest. <laughs> Mm. 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 And during the golden age of Zen, I, I suppose these great Zen masters were might might have been monks, but it certainly wasn't important to the, that important to their teaching. Yeah. But anyways, Buddhist each Buddhist teaching was all, um, you know, all, all uh, was the style of teaching was all. Created, you know, in in the pre-scientific era, so their style of expression is um, very aesthetic. Um, and I mean, there's nothing more beautiful than Dogen reading Dogen. Mm. But it's it's just an, another world from us, you know. Yeah, it's a total yeah. another world. Mm. We have, to, and it shouldn't be forgotten. It shouldn't be ignored, but it, but we, there, you know, I think that um, there's something in in the ideas that are developing now of of the the best of which I think is expressed by um, Bernardo Castro uh, right now, uh -huh. and some other there there are other people too, but I think he's the he's the most eloquent of all of them. Yeah. Yeah. That's very promising. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's 
that's um, uh, I will have to look him up, and I'm sure uh, that I might uh, put a link to him. There it says, Jim Morton suggests you. Here is this guy. Well, um, maybe we'd better uh, call it a day. Uh, we've been talking a couple hours. Uh, oh, not quite. One hour and 50 minutes. 49 minutes. Yeah, 50 minutes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you answered it one minute till 10. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. How, how, um, uh, you're in Bali? Yeah. Yeah. Are you living down there like full time? Yeah. Yeah. Came here in late 2013. Haven't been back to America. How do you manage it visa wise? Uh, oh, our our visa agent is coming by today. I just print up some bank statements and, for, and uh, we'll give him our passports. Um, I don't know what else. I don't know. He takes care of so much stuff. Is it like a re retirement visa or? Yeah, it, it, it's a uh, uh, it's a uh, temporary. Uh, residential visa. Uh, the next one uh, up uh, is a permanent resident visa. It's pretty expensive, you know, like and the cost goes up. It's more like uh, four, four or five thousand dollars each. Uh, is that right? Um, so a lot of people just don't go further. Uh, we don't have to leave the country. We just renew it what, what about, once what about, a year. What about what about medical uh, uh, care? Uh, we don't uh, have medical insurance, uh, but uh, we we keep our Medicare B uh, in America, which costs you know one hundred and five dollars a month or something, uh, and. Uh, well, like I had a hernia operation, uh, really good, modern hospital, 20-minute walk from here, uh, private room, uh, excellent service, uh, you know, and I spent mm, two or three nights there. And the total cost was a little less than $1,000. I see. Uh, and it was very good, very high quality. Katrinka had dengue. She was in the hospital oh, yeah. f four nights, so she was there five days, private room. There was a couch for me, a table and, and for me where I could work, big screen TVs, of course. Uh, you know, buzzers, it's, it's like living in a hotel. People just bring you, you know, I, I could order tea. I could go downstairs to the juice bar and get some really nice juice and, and bring it up to her. I'd also make her uh, juices at home from uh, mangosteen skin and uh, papaya leaf, uh, yeah, you know, right. and stuff, which right. those are both really big here. The thing they say about dengue, though, is, um, is what is that fruit? It's uh, gua uh, guava. Everybody here is into guava for dengue, so we did that too. Anyway, she got really close to uh, dying, but she never felt bad and uh, went away. Anyway, the total cost for that was 1300 I remember. So, so far, just paying for things is cheaper than insurance, uh, but we do get insurance uh, some, but it will have like $2,500 deductible like that. I don't think we've gotten that in the last few years. We have to show that we have insurance, but they 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 take our Medicare card uh, copy of it, uh, uh, which you can't use here. Medicare is only good in America. I still have... Uh permanent resident status in Japan. I kept that. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah. So, um, Keiko says that uh, I can get back into um, uh, 
Japanese health insurance there for about a hundred dollars or so a year. Really? Now that I'm. Hey, just a second. Somebody's at the door. Let me call down to him. I'm up on the second floor. All right. Just hang on. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Ah. All right. <laughs> I'm gonna put my earphones back on. Uh. Ah. Huh. Well. That's a guy who wants to spray for mosquitoes. Oh, that's good. Yeah, uh, unexpected. Uh, but um, I don't like doing it because drink wants to because she didn't want to get dengue again. <laughs> dengue. Well, I, uh, yeah. I spent 45 years in Asia, and um, I'd still be happier there you know, for my own Self, I, I, you know, I, I enjoy living in Asia more than here, although I like it here right now. But I just, you know, Suzuki Doshi and um, all of our teachers there wanted me to come back to America, and I wanted to keep my promise to them. Yeah. But, uh, but now that I'm back, I don't know how to do. You know, I don't know what to do. I mean, if I had, if I hadn't dropped out of traditional Zen, you know, and if I had become a priest and, you know, and uh, stayed with, but all the teachers, well, I couldn't have stayed with any teacher that long because they all died. Yeah. One after the other, you know, because they were all old. Yeah. Uh, but, I, you know, if I had become a priest and, you know, and didn't get involved with my own artwork and stuff like that and just really worked on my, uh, you know, on my be, you know, on, on developing a career as, as a Zen teacher or somebody that looks to other people like a Zen teacher, you know, I, I you know, I could have probably more influence over here than I do. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I didn't want to. I didn't like it. I didn't never, you know, after the first few years of practicing Zen, I lost interest in becoming a monk, you know, and, uh, yeah. I have a lot of ideas, you know, that I'd like to share with people and that I'd like to like to build on and everything, but I don't know how to do it. Or I don't know who who, who I can talk to. Well, uh, I, I could call you back uh, later and we could uh, think about what you want to say and say it to me. Yeah, well, I have to, uh, yeah. All right. I think. Yeah, we can do that. Let's, that let's stay in to touch. I need to. I need to go now. Well, let, yeah, let's. Uh, and uh, sure, uh, um, I'm that. I'm here for you. So uh, uh, right now, I'll just say it's been very interesting. Really good talking with you. And uh, let's stay in touch, and you know, let's talk again in a month or so. All right. And Stanley, I'm talking to Rick and Carolyn next week. Oh, wow. That should be interesting. Yeah, that'll be fun. That'll be fun. I talked to him yesterday Carol, and we Carol, set it up. Carolyn, Carolyn, Carolyn's fascinating. She's, she's very eloquent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, oh. I, I feel like, you know, a dunce compared to her. Oh, oh, that's neat. Okay, well... Really good talking with you, Jim. Yeah, likewise. All right. Take care. Okay, you too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. So thanks a lot, Jim. Very, very interesting. And I do plan to call you again in a month or so. Uh, hmm, yeah, that'll be neat. Uh, so look, until then. This is another, this has been another QQ Audio podcast. I'm DC Booba of QQ Audio and QQ Archives coming to you from Sleepy Senor with Dog at Bandita, Feline Cuchita, and dear lovely Katrinka. And we're wishing you and yours and all of us a grand awakening.